Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for this education panel for the RCO Organ Show. I don't think we're going to have a shortage of things to talk about. There is a lot to cover. So I'd love to just actually jump straight in and start by asking Tom Bell if you could tell us a little bit about some of the ways in which the RCO has been engaging with young people. Well, there's a whole different bunch of levels that we work at. And of course, um, this past year has been quite an interesting opportunity to slightly reinvent certain things and to, to work online. Um, but I think the, the primary most exciting thing is, is the, the courses we work um, on, the courses we lead with groups of students uh, in a particular location with a bunch of top-notch uh, teachers and so on and so forth. They're always really wonderful, not just for the teaching they provide, but for the building of community and the connections that are made between those young organists. Because it, it can be quite an isolating experience sitting in an organ office, as, as everybody here knows, it's something you do on your own quite a lot of the time. Um, so that's one thing. And then there's just all the online content we've been providing um, both before and during COVID on IRCO videos and webinars and so on and so forth, lots of things that people can engage with uh, digitally. Um, and obviously our program of classes that also takes place. I mean, there, there are other things as well. I mean, we've recently been working at accrediting institutions. So not just accrediting teachers, but accrediting, accrediting particular institutions, um, their organ culture, not just the teaching itself, but the fact that it might be, that it's supported at the highest level, that there's a community there of people playing the instrument. And there are a number of institutions which have got on board just in, in recent weeks, Blue Coat School in Liverpool being one, the junior RNCM being another, Radley College being another, and various other schools and other institutions. So there's a lot going on that connects with young people in different ways. Uh, but obviously we, we look forward to doing ever more. If I could just actually open up to everyone at this point, I think one of the things that I'm asked most regularly, particularly by non-organists, is, oh, well, the organ's surely dying out. No one's taking up the organ anymore. And I, I realise I'm faced with people who spend their whole lives bringing the organ to more people and trying to enthuse young people about the instrument. What would you say to someone who said that the organ is dying out? Tom? <laughs> I don't think it is. Uh, what I do think we face is a situation whereby fewer people at all ages come into contact with the organ as part of their daily lives. You know, if you if you zip back 50 years, then, you know, or 100 years even, most people are going to be connected with the church in some way, for example, and thus are going to hear the organ. It's going to form part of the backdrop to their lives, and that that isn't happening anymore. So we have to work harder to make those connections with people. Um, and it, it, there's a risk of it becoming rarefied because where are the places that people come into contact with organs now? Well, often it's an independent school chapel. So we need to we need we, we need to work harder than we used to. But nevertheless, the opportunities are there. Uh, and I still see the same level of engagement and excitement amongst young people playing the organ when I teach on a course uh, that I used to experience when I was one of those young people in the dim and distant past on a course myself. Um. Um. I'm thinking all the way back to uh, the late 1980s when we were saying there is a dearth of organists, the organ is dying out, no one's learning. And so we established National and the Organ Year, which was 1990. And of course, we were just astonished to find that the reverse was true. Um, we had starter packs. I can't actually, and I remember quite how many we sent out. Was it a thousand? Was it 2000? But anyway, it, we'd allowed for 500 and wondered if that was over ambitious. But so many people wrote in saying, send me a starter pack, I want to learn the organ. And we were also astonished to find how many people wrote in saying, I teach the organ, how can I make contact with students? Um, and after National Learn the Organ Year, of course, there was a follow-up organization, the National Organ Teachers Encouragement Scheme. And I suppose you could say every one of us has sort of moved on from there, developed from that point. But of course, we just don't know if there's a shortage of organists, if the organ is dying out, we've got no statistics. But as you say, I mean, here, the nine of us here, we, we're all conscious of a great enthusiasm for the organ um, amongst um, the people we've come into contact with. I think there's much more organ playing going on out there. And actually, I have to say thank you, digital organ companies, for making it so much more accessible to have an organ to use in one's own home. Um, there's almost certainly a shortage of church organists, but that's a different conversation. 
Thank you. I guess one of the things that has also changed recently is the move to doing everything online. I realise most recently that has been a forced move, um, but it's been really lovely seeing so many different organists embracing the online culture. And I wonder, William, if I can just ask you a little bit about everything you're doing with sharing uh, these amazing recitals and pieces on YouTube. Uh, of course, you've been you've been tuning in. Uh, it, well, it's been one of those um, very easy things to do. I'm lucky to have access to a cathedral organ, so I've been uh, whenever I've been in, I've been doing the odd little little recording. But of course, it uh, has the capabilities of, of of reaching an audience that would never have considered either listening to organ music, and of course, it extends to all other forms of music as well. But uh, now I, I, I feel as if in a very small way, what with uh, recording small nuggets of re repertoire and also uh, my uh, fun and games with him sing along most weeks, that, uh, <laughs> that uh, a completely different audience uh, have, have been uh, introduced to a, a quite extraordinary instrument. And I hope that kind of uh media attention or or use of social media continues i know it's not to everyone's cup of tea but I, for for me and the reactions that i've got it's been absolutely tremendous i would also love to ask you really quickly about everything you're doing with using new music to reach new people um i i was listening to your recording of farrington's animal parade and i just love the fact that that shows off the organ as an instrument that is full of humor which we all know it is but for so many it can not be seen as that absolutely i can't think of any other instrument that has that breadth of repertoire and that breadth of color uh, and I think one way of engaging new audiences and perhaps re-engaging audiences that have become accustomed to the, the repertoire that we, we know the organ has stereotypically been associated with, that actually the, the, some of these new compositions and the, the, the Animal Parade is one of the, the best ones, in my opinion, for engaging a, a, a new audience, a younger audience, as you said, is, is fantastic at showing that off. And I wish that there was more repertoire like that that um, could make the instrument more accessible and perhaps that will be something that comes out of the, the, this this past year. We can hope so. Let's move now to think a little bit about teaching and Tom Allery, what have the challenges been of being an organ teacher in recent years and I guess the positives as well because there must be positives too. <laughs> I think for me, the challenge is, I mean, I, I teach at, um, at two schools, which are n newly uh, accredited schools, at Radley College and also at City of London School. And um, there, I think the challenge has been how to engage people of all different levels. It's, um, it's easy to engage your, um, your students who are, are high flyers and maybe come to us with a lot of piano experience, keyboard skills, notational skills. Um, but for me, the challenge is kind of at the, at the lower end, how to engage um, people who maybe don't want to go on and take it to an organ scholarship or take it to uh, and, and to play in a church, for example, um, how to make it quite cross curricular and how to find repertoire that engages them in the right way, particularly at, at starting level. And I'd love to discuss a little bit of ideas of bits of repertoire that people here use for that, particularly for developing pedal technique and finding ways that the piano can be used as a way of, um, of supporting organ studies when you actually, it's quite difficult to find time to get onto instruments. I know at City of London School, the organ's in the main hall. So actually getting onto the organ's quite tricky, but it's, it's um, always a challenge to find ways to enthuse people through the week between lessons, I find. Um, and I, particularly in the last year, I've been doing a lot of um, work on on harmony and figured bass playing, and I've seen a lot of people take that into basically playing pop songs in their in their boarding schools or in the, in their um, groups online. So it's been nice to see those skills come away from the organ as well. William, it it reminds me of a project when uh, Tom uh, was organ teacher uh, when I was director of music at the Royal Hospital School. That uh, a very simple 
simple project, Tom, wasn't it? When we actually just opened the organ loft uh, for the day and thought, oh, we might get a trickle of, I don't know, 20 or 30 kids come along and explore it. And, and, and of course, the organ at the Rosbrook School is quite mega, to say the least. Uh, and actually, I think we had half the school turn up because they were so inquisitive of the instrument. Can you remember that, Tom? Yes, I have fond recollections of uh, just declaring that we'd have an open organ loft day and anticipating that perhaps I'd have about of 750 kids, maybe eight would turn up or something like that. And I'd have a very nice, jolly nice time speaking to them over lunch or break. In the end, we were in the organ loft continuously for seven hours. Uh, absolutely hundreds of kids, whole classes of kids just came pouring through because they all enjoyed singing to it. That was the thing. So they had a relationship with it. That's the, that's, that's, that's the key point. Um, because I guess they were sort of forced to in a way, but there, there was a singing culture in the school. There is a singing culture in the school. So it doesn't really matter whether they were churchgoers by nature or not. Um, and it doesn't matter whether they all started playing the organ afterwards or not either. I mean, some of them did. One of them now flies planes for EasyJet. And he, he had never played an instrument in his life. And he, sat, he decided he wanted to play the organ that day. And by the time he left school, he was playing hymns at chapel. And he was really pretty good. Then he decided he wanted to be an airline pilot. He's doing that instead. But it, yeah, it, it doesn't really matter what their career plans are. The, the point is they were enjoying the instrument. And some of them just were, you know, moved moved closer to it as listeners, even if they didn't actually have a go themselves. But that's it so was good. that appreciation, Tom, wasn't it, that was so critical to that, that day. And I think that's what we're trying to perhaps build upon um as as organists it doesn't matter if you if, if you don't recruit you know 20 or 30 organists that's that's great but actually the appreciation and the knowledge that such an instrument exists can be just as important well i, I feel like that's the thing we we all know as organists that the organ is such an exciting instrument and actually if you can get a kid in the door and given the opportunity to explore the instrument I don't know many kids who don't find that extremely exciting and love putting out the, all the different sounds. Simon? Yes over the years uh, not so much recently but when I first started at the RCA back in 1995 actually it's a direct outcome of um, the National Organ Teachers Encouragement Scheme and National Learning Organ Year which Anne referred to. Um, I did quite a lot of uh, in, um, presentations to especially primary school children and it was so easy I don't think I had any special uh, skills for this but it was so easy to keep a class of primary school children interested for an hour um, ending with a chance of them all just to have a, a quick go on the instrument they're, they're, I, I really f cannot remember any experiences where uh, keeping them interested was a problem and of course it's not just children but adults are fascinated too uh, my own church St George's Hanover Square we've been um, streaming services only over zoom so the uh sound isn't wonderful but um on the sundays i haven't been going in i've been alternating with my assistants uh, uh i've attended the services online and the chat afterwards um it, they, they've been asking me questions about the organ and how it works and how it's played and uh there's a lot of latent interest there i think um which which is ready to be tapped and actually um i'm thinking now of bios's historic organ uh archive, sound archive, Hosa, which Anne Page was instrumental in leading. And just going to what many people might think of as ordinary instruments, small, instruments in small village churches, uh, but, what, but which had a real musical integrity in their own right, you know, 19th century, early 20th century instruments. I think it was mostly East Anglia and, 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 and awakening the interest of the local community, not just the churchgoers, but the local community. This is something you've got in this building you know, a real musical resource, something which is very interesting. And, and that was a very successful project, which I think BIOS want to expand on. Yeah, uh, Andrew, oh, either one, whoever wants to go first. Um, I mean, I, I entirely agree with that, Simon. And I think the, the great thing about the, the HOSA project was that it, it was emphasising to people in a particular place, in, in, in a village, their own church, um, the importance and, and the integrity of what they have right there um, and uh, the way that it can best be exploited. Um, so, you know, you, it's, it's nothing dramatic, it's, it's nothing glamorous necessarily, but it, it's, it's something that you've got there and you might not realise it um, or, or you might realise it and, and you might be excited that somebody is coming and, and being excited about it with you. And this is something which um, Tom alluded to earlier, it's not just about recruit, recruiting players. Oh, sorry, that's the phone, I'll just mute. 
other Andrew, do you want to jump in while we're sorting out the phone? Well, I wanted to raise the point about um, statistics, actually, which was a topic that I think Anne mentioned a few minutes ago. Um, we're often asked how many people are involved with playing the organ and so on. And, and we, we really don't know exact figures. So we, we've sort of derived a few working assumptions. For instance, that there are probably some 20,000 churches in the United Kingdom. Of course, not all of those organs are now in use. Um, but that's a lot of, um, you know, that's a lot of, uh, of property with, with, with organs in them. Um, and certainly a project like the Hoser project has raised the profile of, um, you know, small instruments in village churches of great quality and so on. Um, so there's a lot of instruments out there. Um, in terms of the people who engage with those instruments, um, again, this is really a sort of working assumption. Uh, if you think about those who self-identify as organists through the organizations like the RCO, through BIOS, the Organ Club, through the various regional organist associations, we've perhaps got something like four to 5,000 people. But we reckon the people who actually encounter the organ uh, beyond that might take it up to something like 7,500, 8,000 people. And that would include those that we now call the unexpected organists. Um, they used to be called the reluctant organists, but they're now the unexpected organists, which I think is a nicer way of, of, of um, uh, analyzing that particular constituency. So, of course, the RCO is very keen on uh, introducing the organ to youngsters, and there are lots of really exciting projects that have already been alluded to by, by Tom and William and Simon. Um, but we're also very conscious of those unexpected organists, uh, of those people in their communities who have an interest in the organ, perhaps don't feel that they can self-identify as organists, um, but, you know, we need to nurture them as well. We need to, to promote good tuition, which I know uh, Anne and Frederick uh, are, are very keen to do through their organ tutor and so on, um, but we need to f nurture their ambitions. Um, towards good learning programs, uh, good materials, and also accreditation as well, which is an important part of the RCO's work. Tom? Yeah, I just then, wanted, to, wanted to amplify what um, Andrew McRae just said about the number of people who don't self-identify as organists, if you like. You know, I, I taught for a number of years in rural Kent, um, and that, that activity simply came about because my parents happened to live in that village and there was a new organ in the church, and so I thought, well, I'll start teaching the organ down there. Now, of the number, I mean, I can't remember how many students I had over the 10 years that I taught down there, but of that number, uh, a pretty high proportion were church organists. But there were quite a lot of people who just played for pleasure. So that's the first thing. So there was, there was that sort of group of people at, at, at one end of the spectrum who, who weren't actually playing at church at all. Um, and then there was a bunch of people who were kind of peripatetic organists. So when we say about there being a shortage of organists in churches, actually a lot of places subsist on a rotor because people don't want to commit every single Sunday. So again, there's more organists than we realise going around. But the proportion of organists that I taught who were members of the RCO or BIOS or the IAO, as Andrew was saying, was really relatively small. Um, the, the, you know, and particularly amongst women as well, actually, very, very few of them had joined a local organist association or, or whatever. And, we, you know, and there are probably reasons for that, which perhaps we shouldn't get into right now. But it was, it was an interesting thing to observe. So there are a lot more organists out there than we realise. And none of these people would have gone for lessons up at the cathedral or up in London or anything like that. The only reason why they, they had tuition at all was because there happened to be an organ teacher in their area. Anne and then Frederick? Thank you. I, I was going to make a rather similar point to Tom's, actually. Um, I only teach young students now, and increasingly my students are not in the least interested in playing in church. They have no church connection. They're playing entirely for pleasure. They love the instrument. They love the repertoire. Um, perhaps they want to be organ scholars, but that's got nothing to do with going on to be church organists or indeed cathedral organists. There we are. Frederick? Yeah, I was just going to say that um, getting choristers aware of the organ in the background, I mean, I think when you're training choirs, you're so in such a rush to get the week's music done. But just to be aware, that is a huge resource. And I think a lot of choristers drift through their early choral days, never having sort of turned the pages or, you know, um, gone to the organ. 
So it would be a plea really to get muse, um, choral directors to really get choristers seeing the organ. I mean, a lot of my choristers where I'm at St. George's Cathedral don't even know where I play physically because I'm sort of hidden. And so a couple come around and say, oh, I didn't realize that's where you play, you know. And um, also we of course want to be tremendously enthusiastic about getting people involved to start getting them started. But of course it is that huge transition, isn't it? From, you know, just that initial banging away on the organ and loving the sounds to actually beginning to play. And I don't know, as a, I mean, as a piano teacher, I always found it a huge struggle really getting people from nothing to grade one. And even um, with the organ, you know, the challenge is even greater. So it's really finding that those early levels, isn't it? So that, that's what Anne and I have spent the last few years trying to achieve in our tutor, really, finding that early repertoire, the step-by-step -step repertoire that people can use. And um, yeah, and just be aware that we have to be linked to the culture of piano teaching. I think, you know, we, we, we often forget about the piano and the piano certainly forgets about us but we've got to be making links with, with I think, piano teachers, you know, and the early grounding in the piano for most people is the way is the way through to becoming an organist. I'd love to come back to the organ tutor in just a moment, but I think you raised a really interesting point about the physical placement of an organ. Um, and this, I kind of became even more aware of this in the last year when our girls choir had to move location because of COVID. So they moved from the chapel where the organ is up high and the organist is hidden away to the church across the road where the organist is right next to them. And it was fascinating seeing how at the end of the service they would sit down, the organist would play the voluntary and they would all turn round like wide-eyed watching the feet and going how is he doing that and I think that's what we need to be trying to um, achieve in whatever way we can we need to get that wide-eyed wonder about this extraordinary instrument and we can do that through actually showing as much as possible about what it involves to be an organist I know Andrew you've had your hand up for a while and then William yeah I just wanted to briefly I'd underline something that Andrew McRae said there about the, this term that we, we use now of the unexpected organist rather than the reluctant organist because I think the reality is that a lot of people that we used to view as being reluctant are nothing of the kind. They may have stumbled into organ playing by an unconventional route or because somebody found out they were a pianist and we need an organist and, and we need you to play. But in fact, they are very enthusiastic and, and they want to learn more. They, they want to find out about registration because they, they know nothing about it. Um, and and they've, been, uh, they've been kind of put in this situation. But uh, in my experience, there's actually a huge amount of uh, uh, proactive enthusiasm in people like that. William? Unlike any other instrument, the organ is usually, or can be usually, uh, hidden away. And we find that at uh, St Edmundsbury Cathedral and picking up on what you were saying and Frederick was saying, it's really important that choristers, general public can see what actually happens in the in the organ loft. Um, and uh, the last year has significantly helped us to transport what actually goes on uh, up there uh, downstairs or via live stream we've just had loads of cameras put all over the cathedral including the organ loft which means you can't get away with anything now even when you're not on camera um, but that's the, the, the amount of comments that you then receive or questions live stream questions or, or in person it, it, it has been phenomenal uh, and that can only help the, the instrument and people's knowledge increase and awareness and, and fascination increase for the instrument. I think it also, uh, I'll, Tom, I'll come to you in just a second. Um, I think it also ties into this thing of so many people who say, oh, I hate organ music. I hate going to organ recitals. And I think that is partly tied into the idea of not being able to see anything. Because if you think about how your listening changes, if you have no visual stimulus, I mean, my, the example I always use is when I was a kid and used to watch The X Factor, which I haven't watched in many, many years. Um, but I used to watch it and think, oh, that was brilliant. And then download the MP3 recording afterwards and think, hang on a minute, that was terrible. It was out of tune. And because I'd been watching, 
my ears hadn't been listening in the same way. And I think as organists, we're most of the time asking people to just use their ears and not giving them something to latch onto. Visually. And I don't know about you, Anna, but most, in most organ recitals where I can't see the visual stimulus, I usually drift off to sleep. Uh... <laughs> But having having that, you know, uh, seeing what's going on at, at, at the organ is part of the fascination and, and, and a completely different stimulation. And I, I, I love it. <laughs> Tom. Well, firstly, I, I, when I've seen William with his eyes shut in recitals I've given over the years, I had assumed he was sort of uh, in a state of prayer or ecstasy or something, but clearly not. Anyway, um, it's just this point about communication and letting people see what we're actually doing. Um, a number of people have just mentioned that. And I, I just wanted to uh, give, a, without wishing to be negative, although I'm about to be, I want to give an example of how things should not be done. And it's, it, it's a noted venue which has regular lunchtime recitals and I, you know, wild horses wouldn't track me where it is. But what happens at that particular venue, and I've played there on a number of occasions over the years, is that the recital happens at one o'clock and people shuffle in and there's nobody to welcome you when you arrive at the venue. And there's a stack of uh, printed A4 sheets of paper with the programme on, no programme notes or anything like that, a biography of the performer, a list of future concerts, and that's it. Nobody to welcome you, the, the, the stack of papers poorly laid out, poorly printed, and you go and sit in your pew. And um, at the appointed hour, the church clock dings and the organist who's already sat at the organ just starts playing. So there's no spoken introduction from anybody, let alone about the music, but, but there's not even a hello and thanks for coming. And then you, you play for, you know, 40 minutes or something. And, and, and of course, you know, if anybody claps by accident between movements, they get glared at. Um, and at the end, finally, you're allowed to, you know, politely applause. And then you finally see the person that actually played and that person will bow and then they disappear and that's the end of it. And I, that, that might've been acceptable. <laughs> Well, I don't think it was ever acceptable, actually, but it, it just makes no sense because you're, you're not helping people in the slightest to make a connection with the music or with the instrument. And it really doesn't take much. I mean, it might be a video screen. It might be a few words. It might even be a smile. I mean, come on, guys. Um, so th there's a lot of ways in which we need to kind of wake up, to be completely honest. It's, when we talk about education, it, it's that opportunity as well in concert and so on and so forth. It's not just about how we deliver an organ lesson or a webinar or whatever it happens to be. Simon and then Tom. Yes, so briefly, of course, that takes us on to the repertoire which we choose to play and matching that to the audience. Um, many of us as organists enjoy exploring, uh, I was going to say new repertoire, I don't mean contemporary repertoire necessarily, I just mean um, music we haven't explored, going off into the byways and perhaps overdoing some of that repertoire in, in our recitals. It, uh, um, and not thinking of how that's going to be received by an audience who perhaps for many of them it's their first organ recital or if they do go to organ recitals they don't have a particular knowledge it's easy to assume um, that they're going to be as interested in the byways of italian renaissance repertoire as we might be i think that's all i want to say at that point thank you tom tom i just love the anecdote thank you for that um I was just actually, funny enough, just discussing with a colleague about putting on, we used to do um, a sort of organ afternoon where, where the organ students would play. And I was actually thinking, perhaps that's completely the wrong idea because the moment we do that, we then say only organists available for this afternoon, please. Actually, we were talking about maybe we should be pairing up with other instruments to put on a, so that we can get other instrumental teachers coming into the same thing. And it's all about that sharing practice um, so that we, we don't, even at young age, we don't pigeon ourself, um, ourselves off and, and prevent other people coming. I think that's such a good point. Andrew. Yes, thank you. I, I just wanted to say something about the, um, the, the visibility issue. I think this is really important. I mean, I think organ culture by and large has come on leaps and bounds in the last 20, 30 years in terms of screens and, and, and visibility of the organist. But, you know, just talking to people before the concert and, and pointing out what the body has to do, because the body is so involved with performance, the hands and the feet and also the operation of the stops and any registrational aids and so on that you have. And I think it's, you know, it's a total experience that the organist is going through to perform. And I think just pointing out some of these aspects of, 
what people in music cognition these days talk about as bodily technicization, uh, which is this way in which the body is uh, reacting with the instrument. There's an interface between the player and the instrument. And, you know, it, it, it engages with a relationship on both sides and I think pointing out that sort of thing I think is really important and then people can then watch for that of course during the performance if it's if it's on a screen or if it's on on some sort of monitor but I think that that aspect is really really vital the visibility and we, we forget actually how important visibility is because of course we've had a century or more of recorded sound and we've rather got used to the fact that sound is disembodied from the action of performance um, so, uh, you know, if you go back to the early 20th century, there was something called the Edison test, uh, where people were so disconcerted by the whole notion of listening to disembodied sound on a recording that, that they, they were induced to sort of think about images as they heard the music. You know, there was a, there was a whole kind of routine that Edison, um, the Edison company went through to make sure that people had the proper experience, that it was like recreating what it was like in the concert hall. So, the, the invisibility, visibility thing, I think is really important. And I think, you know, perhaps we need to, to carry on thinking about how we can be really imaginative in terms of that interface with our instrument and how we bring it across. And then the idea of disembodied sound is also so intrinsically linked with the idea of perfect performance, because obviously that disembodied sound is often edited and how many hundreds of takes stitched together. So again, I think we're placing ourselves as organists in quite an uncomfortable situation where people are expecting this disembodied sound to be absolutely perfect and they're hearing everything in sort of HD in a way that they wouldn't necessarily otherwise. Tom, I think, had a point and then Andrew. I was just going to say, I think I think the organ's been one of the most successful instruments in the in the last year in terms of online performances. I and mean, William, your series, to name one of many. And I just would be interested in in how colleagues are going to carry on using. I mean, we, we're in such a great position now um, to carry on that energy, to carry on those visual things, and, and indeed to carry on sharing things online so that people don't have to come to to a particular church. I think we're in such a great, great position to do that. I think of all instruments, I think it's it's brilliant. Andrew McIntosh, do you want to jump in? Yeah, it, it was just this, this question of visibility. And I think we need to remember that it, it cuts both ways. It's not just about the audience, for, for the performer as well. If you are performing in a void, um, it, it's a very different experience to when, when you know that you're, you're being seen by your audience. And, and I think that's, that is an experience that is probably unique to organists, because for any other instrumentalist giving a solo recital, the chances are you're communicating somehow directly with, with your audience. Whereas if you're stuck in an organ loft, or facing a, you know, your back is to the audience. Um, the, the, you know, that, that completely disconnects you. So I think the more that, that we can do as performers to engage with the audience, the better it is. I made a bit of a faux pas yesterday, Andrew. I was playing for a, a cathedral service and they forgot the cameras were up there and I had jeans on. I had my gown on, but I had jeans on. And I saw myself on the screen downstairs and I thought, oh, no. <laughs> But I do think that jeans are possibly the best organ playing attire because they provide the perfect balance between stickiness and slip so you can kind of pivot around. Um, anyway, uh, that makes it feel so much better. <laughs> <laughs> Frederick? Gosh, I find jeans hopeless to play in. No, I think I've got rid of all my jeans now, but um, they're far too sticky. I just end up sort of glued to the bench. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to come back just the whole sort of culture of organ recitals. Um, of course, the huge buildings we often play in and the fact that there isn't a screen available um, means that in a way one has to make a virtue out of, you know, something that is, um, you know, a difficult situation. And possibly if we try and always compare ourselves with, say, a solo violinist or a violin recital where there is that intimacy, usually in a smaller space, you know, we are on a hiding to nothing. So occasionally when I've been playing in a big building, I have sort of encouraged the um, audience to think of it as a special experience that is not like a normal recital where you are going to have to rely more on your ears and think of it more as a sort of meditative 
and sort of prayerful experience. And of course, a lot of our repertoire anyway is more sort of spiritual in inverted commas than, than other more, more direct instruments. And so perhaps in the way that one listens to say a minimalist concert or something, you know, where you have to get into a certain sort of zone, we shouldn't be too jolly. Sometimes, you know, I mean, if you're in a, a lovely small village church, you can do that. You can almost have the intimacy that you would get, say, with a flute or something like that. But um, we have to adapt, you know, we always have to be so adaptable. That's, that's the awful thing. Mm. Frederick, while, while we're with you, I'd love to, and in fact, Anne's just put her hand up as well. Um, I'd love to touch on your new Oxford organ method. I wonder if um, one or both of you could just tell us a little bit about what it is and how it came about and why you decided to introduce this idea. Well, shall I hand over to Anne, as I've just been talking? Can I just put in what the other thing I was going to say first? Um, I was going to pick up Tom Allery's point about um, uh, continuing the benefits of Zoom um, as the world gradually gets back to something more like normality. Um, I don't know if any of the RCO team was going to mention this, but um, the RCO was kind enough to ask Frederick and me to run classes in teaching keyboard skills. And I know there've been other classes online, but of course teaching keyboard skills is fantastic on Zoom. Um, if you can hear the students, which of course is sometimes a challenge, um, but um, it's like having a keyboard studio and the students have really benefited, I think, from uh, working through our Greater Keyboard Musicianship books, um, which I just put in a marketing saying, start right at the bottom, grade one, um, and go up to um, pre diploma level. Um, it's been so lovely for them to be able to work on their own keyboards uh, throughout the class. But also, of course, when we come back to the visibility thing, it's so important too for organists to meet each other. And that's just been a little opportunity for them to make contact during a difficult year. Um, so um, now moving on to the new Oxford organ method, um, Frederick and I uh, cooked up the idea of the, um, the beginner's tutor. Uh, how long ago, Frederick? Two, three years, four years? I can't quite remember now. It was a long time. Something like that. I think it's about, about five years right, ago. <laughs> yes. Um, and um, conscious that students like to play pieces, uh, the whole book is designed around 20 pieces in finely graded order. And that and choosing the pieces, of course, was the main challenge because we had to cover all the major styles to have them in graded order, um, gradual increase of pedal activity and indeed manual technique. Um, and the whole, each chapter leads to the piece. And then Frederick, being a professional composer, of course, um, composed three little studies to follow each piece, each study picking up one of, the, uh, one of the topics taught within that chapter. So those studies not only are lovely little pieces in their own right, but also uh, useful as revision pieces and uh, for sight reading. Um, and, uh, tick so many boxes really. Um, I, I find them extremely useful certainly in my teaching. So that's how it came about and um, we uh, sold the idea to OUP and they published it last year. Um, and we're quite relieved it's all done aren't we Frederick? It was a lot of work. Frederick? Yeah well and just sort of linking it up with a more general discussion really. I mean I think as organ teachers I felt this for many years that um, you didn't have you're ha you didn't have as much opportunity um, face time with students as you would with piano students. Um, and uh, a lot of organ teachers, I think, don't have many students actually, um, compared with piano teachers who might, you know, you can almost teach the piano all week. Um, whereas all, all organ teachers tend to have a handful of students or I know we, we here have more than that, but we're the exceptions really, in particular if you're in central London, you know, you have more opportunity. So choosing those early pieces for the organ, um, I, I don't think I chose my pieces very well for my first organ students, I really regret that. But I think also actually the, the pieces I was given when I first started learning were not really very good. <laughs> so, so it's j just getting, the, that finely graded succession of pieces, as Anne was saying, was the main challenge and hopefully the main advantage of the, of the, of the method, really. 
I think you've just touched on something very interesting, which is this idea that young players love repertoire and possibly don't love keyboard skills uh, to quite the same degree. And I'd love actually at this point to just open it up and um, whenever I'm trying to sort of explain to students why keyboard skills are important, I tend to draw on horror stories where I've desperately needed my keyboard skills. And I was just wondering if anyone here has any similar horror stories that they might be able to share where their keyboard skills have come in extremely useful. Tom? I was going to say, everybody's holding back because nobody wants to share their most embarrassing tales. <laughs> but my, my interest as a, as a teenage organist was always very much in the repertoire and also to some extent in improvisation as well. So despite the best efforts of my teacher at the time, I really neglected things like transposition and so on and so forth, keyboard skills. Um, and I had to mug up pretty quickly to audition as a cathedral organ scholar, which by some miracle um, I managed to successfully do for a gap year. But, um, that these things weren't hardwired in my brain. I'd sort of, I'd, I'd mugged up for the audition and got passably, you know, decent at doing it, then not thought about it again until I arrived to sort of play for an even song in September and needed to transpose a hymn or something. And it was just, you know, unbelievably stressful. So I, again, I think I do the same thing as you, Anna. I sort of say to my students that, um, you know, this is a, this is something that's worth doing because it equips you for, for, for later life and you won't get caught out. But I just want to, I was really interested in what uh, Tom Allery was saying earlier on that, you know, that there are various of these skills that we teach, which kind of have a, have a life beyond the organ loft. And I think that's the other thing we can say to our students is this isn't just about passing an exam or auditioning for something or whatever it is, or, in, or indeed being able to survive in the professional church music world. This is, this is stuff that can be fun. It can be a, a route to a wider world of creativity. So I think that's, that's something we should definitely say to our students. So I'm going to take that away from this discussion, Tom Allery. I'm going to remember that. Frederick? Well, just to emphasize that really, that you know, it's only when you really know how music is put together. Ian Carr actually gave a wonderful talk on this at our recent um, RCO conference. Um, and I, I suppose I've developed a little bit of a niche teaching the written papers for the RCO. And I know it all sounds very grim and old fashioned, but it's really only when you know how a piece of music is put together. Um, and, and OK, knowing the actual technical terms, in a sense, is a bonus. But in a way, you've got to you've got to talk about things with names, really just for practical purposes. But, you know, people who play are playing the organ well, are understanding how the phrases breathe and how the cadences are working and where the high points are. And unless you've got some sort of technical underpinning, theoretical underpinning, you're never going to really be a first rate organist. And I think keyboard skills are so connected with that. I don't know what other people think, but I, I think so. Tom and then Anne. I was gonna say my horror stories actually come from, mainly come from out of the organ loft and in, you know, in a sort of choir practice or a piano situation or a, accompanying a violin exam or something like this. Um, and I was going to say, I, I actually always draw on um, interest outside of the organ when teaching keyboard skills. Um, some of my students, I mean, the City of London is a secular school, so I can't, they don't have an opportunity to play a hymn because there are no hymns on that organ. So, you know, fabulous instrument. And looks wonderful and it's a wonderful thing but it will never play mags and nunks or hymns so that that idea is completely out of there so i tend to always draw on things that are outside of of church music and out, out of our out of our usual remit and then bring it back in and i try and always connect the skills I, frederick i like what you're saying that I, th I think it's all about connecting the skills so if you're if you're score reading in five parts you're actually playing harmony you're basically playing the same musical material as in a hymn, when you're transposing. I think that's the key. And then Andrew. Thank you. This isn't my most embarrassing moment because my happy attitude to life is dependent on my selective amnesia. Um, all I can remember, uh, um, well, I remember two things I'd like to share. One is my terror of improvising, but that's another story. Um, I think I've got over that now. Um, the other thing I particularly wanted to say is, don't you think the negative package we have around keyboard skills and that our students may have around keyboard skills is because we remember being faced with these big challenges we had to overcome when we were uh, entering diplomas or perhaps um, taking up an organ scholarship. 
um, and we hadn't actually done the background because don't you think um, when we dislike something it's because we can't do it and if we can only start our students doing simple keyboard skills at an early level I think I can honestly say my students find them fun um, and that's how it should be and Tom, Tom Mallory, thank you so much for the idea of applying them to pop music. I'm not sure if I'm equipped to do that, but I think it's a great idea and I can certainly encourage my students to explore that idea further. So I do think as teachers, um, if we want to equip our students for um, whatever the future might bring, um, it, it's important to include keyboard skills right from the beginning and to find um, uh, exercises which Frederick and I hope we've provided in our books uh, to find exercises which are at a manageable level for them so that they can enjoy them. We've got a whole sort of tranche of questions coming in. If we go to Andrew uh, first, I do actually have a question which Andrew Palmley has asked me to ask you, Andrew, uh, just to add to the Andrews in the room. Andrew <laughs> Palmley sent me a sort of list of questions to look through and one of them I thought was slightly cheeky but he insisted I ask you um, do you think you would pass your FRCO now? <laughs> Are you asking me? Yes. I don't have an FRCO and I don't think I'd be allowed to take one now. <laughs> <laughs> what were you going to ask? Sorry. What was I going to say? Um, I was going to agree with Anne actually um, uh, about her uh, attitude towards keyboard skills. And it's, it's really great to know that um, you know, people are, are finding these things fun. I think that's really great um, news. Um, and I, I suppose when we look at the examinations, um, the diploma examinations, um, you know, at their best, we're hoping that they have the right sort of ethos, that people are seeing the connections between the component parts. They're seeing the connections between the um, playing, the repertoire performance, and then the skills, and then also the written work. And, and the written work, I think, is very much sort of a traditional British view, hopefully updated, but a traditional British view of theory as the observation of practice. So we're, we're trying to get people to, to look at a variety of models and to understand what they're playing and what they're trying to perform from the point of view of contrapuntal techniques and harmonic language, uh, and, and also historical inquiry. And with historical inquiry comes critical inquiry. You know, it's understanding compositional techniques and styles, uh, but it's also understanding something of the context as well, something of the, of the reception and the, and the environment of which music has, has evolved in particular ways for particular reasons. So I think that holistic view of the diplomas uh, we're very keen to emphasize, and I think we've always had that but hopefully what we have now is a kind of um you know 2021 version of that 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 comprehensive ethos of interconnected skills critical inquiry and performance and performance practices that are associated with that mm. should you simon and then tom uh, just to reveal an embarrassing experience which relates to this point about teaching keyboard skills i, I remember very early on in my organ lessons probably after a month or something um, my teacher said, um, oh, look at that hymn and come back next week and play it down a tone. And that was no instruction. And I came back the next week and couldn't do it. And there was still no instruction, just a bemused look on his face. I suppose he had always been able to, as I found with just very, very few of my students, there are some people who kind of naturally do these things. So how we teach them, as Anne's alluded to, bite-sized and finely graded exercises. But also, I think as teachers, it's very easy to especially if we're preparing candidates for exam, if we look at the regulations, and so they've got to play three pieces, then they've got to do keyboard, then they've got to do some sight reading, and if they're organist, transposition or whatever, and then they've got to do some oral, and to teach the whole thing in those separate chunks, and never to get the student, and indeed the teacher, to relate all those things together. Um, so it's a kind of what Andrew was saying, theory as the observation of practice, and uh, relating transposition to, to improvisation, to harmonisation, to um, how a piece has been structured and the key cadence points and, uh, and all that sort of thing. Not thinking in terms of the paragraphs of a syllabus. Tom? I was just going to say, how great would it be to aim to a situation where we never actually say 
Now let's talk about keyboard skills. I just, I just hate the term. I like, I can feel my heart rate increasing even as we're talking about it because because as as teachers we're going well, right now we've got to think about how to do that and actually all of the skills are in are in our repertoire when we first encounter a piece of music we do a bit of sight reading when a composer reuses a piece of material we're transposing etc cetera, etc cetera. i just hate that i'd love to come up with a different term for that well we used to call anyone else would we used to call them tests, of course. We thought we think we've been rather progressive now to call them keyboard skills. <laughs> so definitely less frightening, but uh, I'm sure we could come up with a better term still. Uh, Tom Bell? Well, perhaps, perhaps there's something in this reluctant organist, unexpected organist thing. Perhaps we could do something similar with the tests, where previously there was something people did reluctantly, but now sight reading becomes unexpected performance or something <laughs> like that. Oh, gosh. Um, Andrew? Perhaps we can take a, a leaf out of Bach's book and we sh should just simply call them keyboard practice. Uh, everything that we do is keyboard practice. Klavier Übung, one, two, three, and four. And uh, in his title pages, he talks about engaging with the connoisseurs and the amateurs uh, and, and also for the refreshment of their spirit. Mm. I would love to take a very brief uh, visit to Scotland and ask Andrew McIntosh if you could tell us a little bit about the Scottish organists training scheme that you're involved with and how that kind of interacts with the RCO. Uh, sure, so Scott, uh, which is the Scottish Church's organist training scheme, is a, 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 a partnership between the RCO and a number of other organisations, the Scottish Churches, the Scottish Federation of Organists, which is the umbrella body for the IEO local societies in Scotland, um, and the RSCM. Uh, so it's really everybody who's involved with uh, the organ on, on the ground in Scotland. And it's a, a scheme which provides support for those unexpected organists that, that we were talking about before, uh, who find themselves playing in churches, either uh, the people who have been playing for a long time, who've uh, never had any uh, formal tuition or people who are pianists or who have other um, uh, musical backgrounds and who've been, uh, uh, you know, had their arm twisted because they happen to be there and because it's, uh, somebody's found out that they're musical and, and they don't have anybody to play the organ. And, and so what it does is it provides a, a, a structured scheme by which uh, you can uh, have have your playing and, and not just your repertoire playing but your liturgical skills accredited by by a, a three stages of assessment but also uh, you have support you're, you're matched up with an advisor who is somebody locally who is not necessarily your organ teacher or who is emphatically not your organ teacher but is simply somebody who's there to, to hold your hand give you a bit of support mm -hmm. and then uh, sitting alongside that is a series of local organ workshops which take place throughout the year where people come along and uh, there's various themed sessions on aspects of uh, registration or choosing hymns or playing hymns and uh, you know all these building blocks that the you know people may not have encountered at all and and you know they, they're very grateful to uh, to have the opportunity to learn more and I, I mean, I think there's a number of interesting things about it. One, as I suggested earlier, is the enthusiasm with which people come to something like that because they want to learn and they, they want to find out more. And uh, the second thing is, is the, the importance of locality, um, it, the importance of, of not saying, well, we're going to run a, a, a workshop on him playing in Edinburgh this month. Please come to it. The, what we're actually saying is, well, we're coming to Auburn. Or we're coming to Greenock, and you know, please come along and 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 you know, public. And so we, you know, you don't just get people who are in the scheme coming to you; get other local organists. And the further out you go from the central belt, and the more remote you go, generally the more people come, which I find absolutely fascinating. Um, and so I, I think it, it's it's not just about providing uh, the technical support to people, but it's it's just being there actually, and, and providing a shoulder to cry on sometimes. You know, but people who, um, who have no self-confidence about their musicality because they've, they've never uh, had formal musical education or because 
somebody else in the parish is is actually calling the shots you know the minister or the priest is is the person who's making the musical decisions and you maybe don't have the self-confidence to challenge that or to uh, you know have your own input um so i i think it, it it's something that that underlines the importance of not just formal technical education and support but but looking at it in the round i think the idea of having um a bit of hand holding is actually a really important one. I mean, I don't want to embarrass Tom, but when I arrived at Morden, I remember a very vivid memory of Tom Allery very kindly um, doing the swell box for me with his hand through the organ shutters because I was too scared to take my foot off the um, off the pedals and use a swell box tool. And he came away with cuts on his wrist because he was so good with his swell box control. And I think this idea of uh, just sort of looking after young organists is really important. It actually brings me on to one of the last points I'd like to raise as a sort of open idea, and that's the concept of looking after players' mental and physical health, and what we as teachers and as organists should be trying to do. I wonder if anyone has anything they would like to contribute to that. Frederick? Well, one very simple and rather banal thing is for teachers to prepare their lessons. Um, you know, it's so tempting to go into a lesson unprepared and just to give that 10 minutes really is all usually what it takes um, to prepare lessons and really think about where a student is and what their needs are. I think students really appreciate that actually. Tom? I also think it's it can be. I mean, it can it can cut both ways because it can also be potentially scary. But um, if, if if you have a get together of your students, not necessarily for performance, but a, a a class or a social. I mean, you know, those who want to play can do. Um, you know, and so it, sometimes it can be very helpful for a person who's nervous of pedaling or swell pedaling or something like that to sit and. Perhaps there's somebody else who's a little bit uh, more forthright than they are, but e equally um, at, the, at the same level, sort of who is prepared to sit down in front of other students and make a slight mess of something and seek the guidance. And then that emboldens other people. And so that, that again, what, what I was saying earlier on is that sort of there's a sense of isolation to being an organist if you're not careful. Um, and so plugging people, trying to plug people into uh, a community. Uh, and introduce them to other people who are having the same struggles or enthusiastic about the same things, enjoy the same things. Uh, I think that can make an enormous difference. Tom Allery. I completely agree, Tom. I, I was going to say just um, for those of us who, who are lucky enough to teach in, for example, in a school environment, just to try and make connections with our non-organ colleagues. Um, I, I find it um, I enjoy the challenge of trying to do that. I mean, we don't teach often in the same building. So if you appear to have a cup of coffee at break time, you then have to disappear off earlier to get back to the, to the, you know, the village church or the organ or whatever it might be. Um, I, I just think it's so important to see the organ in the company of other <laughs> instruments that, that people are learning, that are also being taught in different schools and in different institutions, so that we can share the same practice. And it's about, again, not pigeonholing ourselves off as organists. We have the same, we have our own challenges, of course, physically as players, but it's the same thing that, that everyone else is teaching. And I, I'd love to see more of that practice going on, mm. shared practice. And? Um, physical health first. Um, I've done a lot of teaching of organ teachers in the past and one of the things I'm constantly nagging others to do is don't spend the lesson looking at the score, spend the lesson looking quite as much at the player to just check how they're using their hands and their feet and how they're sitting and so on. It's ever so tempting and if you look at photographs of people teaching the organ, almost always you see there's the teacher looking up at the score instead of looking at the student. And I identify that it's really tempting to look at the score because you're thinking about the music. So look at the student, I say. Um, mental hit what I said. Um, I think loneliness is a really big challenge, especially for older organists and especially out of the big cities where they can't easily mingle with others. And I have to say, especially for women, as Tom Bell said early on in this discussion, women tend not to join organist associations and uh, they're not very numerous within the OSEO either, sadly, but I hope that's improving. Um, and that can I just do a little plug for the Society of Women Organists and we've seen 
um, how women have just rejoiced at having other women organists to talk to. Oh, there are other women playing the organ. It's been quite a, well, perhaps it's an exaggeration to say it's a revelation, but it's certainly been a great pleasure to have um, um, women organists um, finding an opportunity to meet and talk to each other. I think the sense of community is, is so important. Um, I'm aware that we need to wrap up in a moment, but William, do you want to jump in? Thanks. I, I'm also conscious of, of the time and, and I know um, Tom uh, would perhaps like to uh, say something as well about um, this uh, exciting project which uh, wraps up and, and uh, encompasses many of the points that we've been discussing. Uh, Tom, would you like to, to, to elaborate further? Yeah, sure. I, I, this is um, something that we've just been working on in the last few months. It's, a, it's an idea. We've called it Project Organ World. Um, it's a sort of working title, but some people seem to like it, so maybe that's what it will stay as. Um, but something that's occurred to the RCO uh, and other people who commented on this is that, okay, so we've now got this amazing digital resource in the shape of IRCO where we can provide um, webinars or whatever it is, video content for people who, if you like, are inside the tent. You, you, have, you have to be a, a sort of a card carrying member of the organ community um, to, to know that IRCO even exists. Now, what, what we're working on creating is a website that will be full of commissioned material of all different kinds uh, that is for people outside the tent. And so that might be um, material for use in schools that is not about the organ necessarily, but use the organ as a tool, for example, for the science curriculum, as well as obviously, yes, musical stuff that uh, introduces the organ to people in the classroom and sort of slightly sort of normalizes it, if you like. Uh, but there'll also be sections on getting started and um, showing a person who perhaps is completely on their own out in Oban, but they've not they've missed the Scots uh, event over there or, 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 you know, in rural Kent where I used to teach people who were completely out of the loop in, in terms of the organ world. Um, will give them some very basic guidance. I mean, I mean, I mean stuff like how to adjust the height of the bench or switch the thing on where you might find the key or, you know, it, it, the utter basics. Uh, but also uh, materials to for music therapy, materials for helping all people who are already organists to share better, sort of stuff we've been talking about quite a lot today, um, with, with, with the uninitiated. So this is a project we've worked, we're beginning to put together, um, and it's, it's a sort of developmental stage at the moment. That's it's a one-stop shop, isn't it, uh, yeah. Tom? A place to, to, to go for people who are interested in the organ, uh, to, to nurture their interests and to develop that interest. And But uh, the overriding point, I suppose, that both of us want to get uh, across is this project supports all other outreach work. Anyone telling someone else about the organ can point them to in the direction of this of this project. It's it, it's serving the entire, um, or is the RCO serving the entire uh, organ community uh, and and beyond? Uh, as Tom alluded to, it's 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 giving uh, schemes of work, lesson plans, resources, video resources, the whole shebang uh, across the uh, curriculum, but also d uh, developing and exploring all the other parts of the curriculum that the organ world. Uh, all the world's tentacles expand into physics, chemistry, arts, humanities. It's, it's, a, it's an extremely exciting uh, journey we're about to embark on. Well, I have to say, I think that sums up the sort of attitude of the last hour, which seems to be an extremely positive one. And I for one have found it um, really quite inspiring hearing you all talk about your various different projects and the ways in which you are helping make the organ more accessible. So thank you so much uh, for joining us and sharing all of your ideas for the RCO Organ Week. And hopefully we can all actually meet up in person and celebrate the organ and all of our these wonderful achievements over perhaps a gin and tonic at some point in the near future. Thank you all so much. <laughs>